today I'm going to be presenting some information about a research project that I have that's actually ongoing. So I'll be presenting some preliminary findings, but I'm still in the process of conducting the study. So at some future date, I would have some better findings for you. Um, this project focuses on the potential advantages of Syrian diaspora assistance to diaspora refugees or to refugees, rather. Um, when I talk about the diaspora here, I'm thinking of people who um, are economic migrants to places outside of Syria who maybe they or their parents migrated a generation ago and now are providing aid back to um, forced migrants inside Syria and in the neighboring countries nearby. Um, my presentation does focus on advantages, but I want to be very clear that um, I am not suggesting that diaspora aid is some sort of magic bullet that can solve all kinds of problems. We know there's a lot of things that are problematic about diasporas being involved in conflict, so I just want to acknowledge from the outset that um, I am aware of that and I'm happy to have a conversation about that, but because of um, the topic of this paper, I'm looking specifically at potential adva advantages. Let's see. OK. All right. So some of the preliminary findings that I have to present today are about some of the characteristics of these folks that are engaged in diaspora aid. And this is that they have very strong motivations to be engaged in aid um, because of their familial ties, their ancestral ties to the region. Um, this causes them to be willing to persist even in the face of a lot of um, barriers to being able to provide that aid. They feel this very strong obligation to persist in providing aid. Uh, there's a lot of cultural competence and familiarity that comes with being a member of the diaspora, although, as I will mention, there are some limitations to that as well. And also, there are a lot of informal accountability mechanisms that come up in the, this provision of aid that are based on those social network ties that come from familial ties and friendship ties in the region. So I want to talk a little bit about what diaspora philanthropy is, because I know it's not a concept everyone has heard of necessarily. Many of us are familiar with diaspora remittances. I think this audience in particular probably knows quite a bit about remittances. And there is some relationship between the two. So these data are a bit dated, but the purpose really is to provide a sense of scope rather than precision. So the, this data from 2014 is we have 180 million migrants from poor countries around the world who send money home. Um, usually on a monthly basis, if not more. So this is a lot of money that's coming back to um, sending countries. And we know that some portion of this money is in the form of philanthropy towards social projects, although it's very difficult to get a good idea of the figure there, the precise figures there. If we compare this to foreign aid, we see that actually remittances is, has much, is much larger than foreign aid if we look globally. So we realize that this, there's a lot of development potential in remittances um, if they're used appropriately and effectively. This is just an example of the impact of remittances in various countries. Again, this data is a little bit dated at this point, but on average, migrants send home about 200 US dollars per month to their country of origin. And if we think about a place like Somalia, where the income is about $250 a year is the average income, then we can imagine that in some countries, that's really quite an impact to have those remittances coming home. So when we think about diaspora remittances and the research on remittances, we have reason to believe that some of that also would apply to um, diaspora philanthropy, which I, in a moment I'll describe exactly what I mean by that. We know that remittances have large impacts on local economies. They tend to increase with instability and conflict. This is different than other forms of aid. A lot of times other forms of aid decreases when places become more unstable and there's more conflict. Remittances tend to go up because family members are very concerned about the people in their home country. So it has sort of more of an insurance effect that when times get rough, the money's going to increase. Um, the money goes directly to the poor. It's not going through intermediaries. Uh, we do have pretty good research that shows that communities that receive high levels of remittances tend to have higher school attendance, less school dropout, higher birth weights, all kinds of things that we know are really positively associated um, with well-being in communities. Now there are some challenges as well. We know that the impacts of remittances, and we assume also of diaspora philanthropy, is unequal across communities and across individuals. Oftentimes, folks who are able to send migrants abroad are not necessarily from the poorest or most in need communities. Um, my own country in the United States is a great example. We have 
many, many Indian migrants to Silicon Valley who are engineers and make lots of money and they send a lot of money back to India, but that money is not going to the poorest of the communities because typically those folks who are able to migrate are not from the poorest Indian communities. So we are not sure that there's going to be equal impacts in terms of those remittances. And um, also, the, this, these are intertwined, this idea that the communities that, that are most able to send are not necessarily the ones that are in most need of the money. And also, remittances, the investments are largely personal, and they don't always address widespread social needs. So you might be sending money home for your, your family member's health care to help your mother repair her house, something like that. And um, whether or not it goes out into the broader community is still of question. So for this project, I'm looking specifically at diaspora philanthropy. And so what I define this as for the purposes of this research project is money, goods, volunteer labor, knowledge and skills, other sorts of assets that are donated to a community that is broader than your family members in a country or a region where you have um, population with ancestral ties. So the idea here would be that it's not just your family members, it's going outside of that. And the second thing that's key is that it's not, I personally expand it beyond just country of origin because this allows us to consider, for example, Syrians in Great Britain who are sending money back to Turkey to help Syrian refugees in Turkey, right? It's not the country of origin, but it's a, a, it's a southern country that's a host of a lot of these, of these displaced people. There's a lot of research on mechanisms of diaspora philanthropy. Today, I'm specifically talking about this area in red, which is foreign-based ethnic NGOs. So the folks that I've interviewed for this project are all members, founders, most of them, of um, formal NGOs that are small Syrian diasporan NGOs. So some of the presumed advantages of diaspora philanthropy that we see in the really small but growing literature on diaspora philanthropy is this idea that diaspora members may be better able to target difficult to reach locations or populations. They presumably would have a better understanding of local needs and how to circumvent maybe challenges in the local system because they have that cultural familiarity with the systems in their local context. Um, there's a greater interest in persevering in spite of obstacles that might drive out other sorts of aid organizations, um, that they would be able to identify local partners better and identify whether partners are trustworthy in a better manner than other types of organizations may be, and also that they might have greater credibility with those partners. So because they are from the area, they speak the language, they have the cultural competence, those partners would see them as more credible. Um, and also there is some argument that diaspora organizations might be more willing to address uh, problems that are controversial in the local community because of those country of residence norms. So for example, there's an argument that perhaps diaspora members are more willing to deal with issues of gender equality, you know, gay and lesbian issues, other kinds of issues that might be considered controversial locally, but would be maybe in the country of residence where they've migrated to would be considered um, more reasonable to try to address in some way. There are also challenges. We know that new migrants usually have really limited financial resources, so being overly reliant on those migrants is a challenge. Um, there is some argument that countries of origin who are overly reliant on remittances may neglect development goals. They might say, oh, well, people are sending money home. It's their job to take care of that work. The state is no longer really going to address some of those needs, and so that's a concern. Um, depending on why migrants left, the, the countries of origin might be very resistant to that investment, especially if people left for political reasons or reasons of conflict. And there's also issues that diasporans might be well-meaning, but not particularly professional, right? These are usually people that they're not professional aid workers. This might not, they don't maybe have training in public health or social work or education and those sorts of things. So they're engaging in well-meaning efforts, but the question of effectiveness arises because of that training. And as we know, diasporans may also exacerbate conflict in some areas. So my work focuses on Syrian migrants, and I know we've all heard a lot about the crisis in Syria, but I just wanted to remind us a little bit of um, how the crisis stands at the moment. There are 5.1 million refugees that have fled Syria at this point. We have um, 4.8 million of those refugees are in the global south. So in spite of all of the media attention to migration to Europe, the vast majority of these refugees are living in neighboring countries in the global south, which includes Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, Turkey and Lebanon. Um, Turkey hosts the largest number of refugees um, in terms of number. In terms of proportion to the local population, Lebanon hosts the greatest 
um, sort of proportion of refugees relative to the local population. And then inside Syria, of course, we have all kinds of problems continuing. Um, 6.3 million internally displaced people, and then about 13.5 million that have been identified by the UN as being in need of humanitarian assistance, even if they've been able to remain in their own communities. So huge humanitarian crisis that we've all heard quite a bit about. So it's important um, to consider the specific needs of migrants who migrate to other southern countries as opposed to wealthier northern countries. Um, so refugees who are able to migrate to European member states, we have a sense that they are better off than refugees that stay in the south. And by better off, I do not mean to um, underestimate their suffering in any, in any way. But we know that people who stay in the global south are more likely to be less affluent. They're more likely to be children or mothers of young children. If you're elderly, if you're ill, with your, if you're a person with a disability, you're not going to be able to migrate all the way to Europe. So the people who stay in the global south, first of all, we have way more refugees in the global south. Second, they're a group that's particularly needy, even in comparison to the broader refugee population. And then um, I wanted to talk a little bit about Lebanon as a host state, quite a few of my interviews are from Lebanon, and I think it just provides a really interesting examination of what southern host state capacity is. So in Lebanon, for context, it's about 1 23rd the size of Ghana. We're thinking about a pretty small geographic area, about a third of the size of Belgium, for people who maybe aren't as familiar with the geographic size of Ghana. So we're talking about a relatively small country. Um, the population of Lebanon in 2012, before the conflict started, was about 4.6 million. Now we have more than 1 million Syrian refugees um, in Lebanon. They're actually not called refugees because Lebanon doesn't recognize formally that there is a conflict happening in Syria. The Lebanese state has not legally recognized that, and so they're, um, they are visitors to Lebanon. Um, and I have here highlighted that that data is from May 2015 because that in 2015, the government of Lebanon asked the UN to stop registering new arrivals. So um, we know that the number is actually much higher than 1 million, but um, those folks have not been counted because the Lebanese government asked them to stop registering those new arrivals. Um, Syrian refugees live in more than 2,000 communities. They've also built almost 1,500 informal refugee settlements in agricultural land and other places around the country. 70% um, of these migrants in Lebanon live below the poverty line, so they're very, very much in need. And Lebanon currently hosts the third largest number of refugees of any country. So we have all these folks who have fled Syria, all the people who are displaced within Syria, and then thinking of Lebanon as a host state, Lebanon is a country that already had very weak infrastructure even prior to the conflict. They had their own civil war and ongoing sectarian conflict after the civil war that they've been recovering from. Some of you may have heard about the Lebanese garbage crisis in the news, like really basic services are not always conducted there, and so to have an additional million people there is really quite a burden. Well, they've been wonderful hosts, but it's quite a challenge for, the, for local organizations. So for this study, which is in process, um, I, this is very, very brief methods, but I'm doing semi-structured interviews with people who are in leadership roles in Syrian diaspora nonprofits. These are formally registered nonprofit organizations, although they're registered in different countries. They're not registered in Lebanon because the Lebanese government won't allow them to register there. Um, I've been able to interview 26 folks who are in leadership roles. Um, by that, I'm thinking of founders of the organization, board members, people who are um, sort of in a management level of directing programs and services and different initiatives. Um, these are the people I've done formal interviews with. I've been able to have conversations with upward of 100 um, Syrian diasporans about their efforts there in Lebanon. And all of the people that I've interviewed are, are either Syrian or they're of Syrian descent. So these are some of the sites of um, where the folks live that I've been able to conduct interviews with. And I already have my five minute warning, so I'm going to do my um, findings more quickly. One of the big findings of the project is that um, diaspora identity is a really strong motivator of philanthropy around these groups. People feel a real obligation um, to, to give aid to their fellow Syrians because they have those ancestral ties. And that's something that we would expect from the literature. And anyone who's interested in my full paper, I have a lot of great qualitative quotes that really demonstrate this, and I'd be happy to share that with you. But this diaspora identity is a very, very strong motivator of philanthropy. Um, 
This awareness that, that their fellow Syrians are reliant on assistance has created a real sense of obligation. So even during times when other, maybe not the largest state organizations like the UN, but when other mid-sized NGOs are deciding to pull out because things are becoming too difficult and too dangerous, these organizations actually feel an added obligation to give more and get, become more involved. And this is something that we know from the literature on remittances, but we did not know really about, the, about diaspora philanthropy. I, we do, I do also find that there's additional cultural competence and local knowledge that um, helps in the work that these organizations are doing. This is limited, however, in certain ways. So what I find is that people who um, grew up in the region or nearby have much more cultural competence than, for example, people who grew up in um, North America or in Europe. And so an example I might share is I was attending a meeting um, with a lot of Canadian Syrian diaspora members and they were proposing some solutions for the schools and they said well we're gonna buy everybody iPads we're gonna install apps and the students can learn um, on these iPads and these apps in Lebanon in these camps and I had gone to visit these camps and so I sort of as the outsider had to remind them well there's no Wi-Fi in the tent camps and also there's not always electricity and there are not apps in Arabic and the students don't speak English yet and so some of these things that um, someone who maybe hasn't visited the context in quite a while, it's not obvious to them, these, these sorts of barriers that exist. And so one future direction of research I'm very interested in is looking at um, diasporans from different regions of the world and seeing how maybe the impressions and the understanding of local needs varies in those different regions. One of the things that I find most interesting in the project so far is the kind of accountability mechanisms that these organizations are able to develop because of their friendship and familial ties. So these organizations are doing things like carrying cash across international borders because there's no operating banking system inside of Syria. They're trying to, they're not allowed to open bank accounts in Lebanon. They can sometimes do that in Turkey, but when they're trying to move money, they're having a, a local person go to the ATM every day and withdraw cash to maybe pay their doctors, pay their teachers. So there's a, there are many, many opportunities for, um, for a lack of accountability, right? For theft, theft and embezzlement and all sorts of things. But with their social network ties, they're really able to identify trust, trustworthy partners because of this reliance on familial networks. Someone's cousin knows the person in the village who's gonna go ask everyone in the village, what do you think of this person? And, and find out whether or not that person is a trustworthy, um, individual to work with. And it's also very useful in terms of identifying other kinds of partners because they don't just have a humanitarian aid network. They also have, um, they're from a variety of different professions, right? So if you need someone who can do cement work, they have someone who knows how to do that and can come rebuild the school. So there's sort of this access to a broader network than some others have. And the reputation, of course, as you might imagine, is really key in this environment. Um, and some of you might say, well, reputation matters in all aid environments. All organizations are concerned about reputation, and if they get a, reputa a poor reputation, it's going to be harmful to their work. And that certainly is true. But in these diaspora communities, the role of reputation is much higher stakes, because it's not just that you're going to professionally have a poor reputation. You're in your family network, in your friendship network, in the village network, you will get a bad name. And that's something that's considered very damaging, not just to you professionally, but to you socially. So there's, there's a very, very strong motivation to only recommend someone if you're absolutely confident that they can be a good partner. Um, and to only work with people that you are absolutely confident are going to do high quality work for you because the social stakes are very, very high. And so again, um, I'm happy to talk with you more about this later, um, but there are, of course, there are advantages and there are also limitations. Um, the folks, who I interviewed were very clear to say, you know, we help people in my village because that's where I know people, is from my parents' village and my grandparents' village. I know there's other communities where they need help, but I don't have contacts there. So it is very much reliant on the social network. So the social network brings benefits, but it also means you're limited to that population. Um, I thank you for your time. I think my time is up. I got my zero minute sign, and I'm more than happy to talk with you a little bit more later. Thank you.